Haitians are all of a sudden people. We the people. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Pipeless Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I host this series of half-hour weekly cable access programs produced here at the studios of Portland Community Media. Today our guest is Shelley Lawrenson. Shelley is a member of the Action Committee of the League of Women Voters here in Portland. Welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Good. Yeah. I'm glad you're here. Um, a couple of weeks ago you co-wrote a op-ed in the Portland Oregonian called uh, Portland State Urban Renewal Plan Short Changes Crucial City Services. So and, um, and so this was talking about a new urban renewal district here being formed around Portland State University. And so would you just give us a brief description of, of what urban renewal districts are? Well urban renewal districts are um, intended to be blighted areas and cities that um, a, a city council will identify as needing um, an extraordinary investment. Um, urban renewal really is a financing tool as opposed to a, a, a physical, it's both a physical designation, but it's really at the end of the day a financing tool. So the way it works is um, the city will say, well this particular area of town is blighted um, it is, per the statute, um, requires an extraordinary emergency sort of investment. And this is what authorized them to, to reach out and not just put city dollars into the district, but they reach out and they grab the school dollars and the county dollars that would otherwise um, go to schools and county and dedicate them to that particular area. Okay, all right. And urban renewal districts are allowed to be formed under state law? Is, is that right. where they're, okay. is a, so that's there, the authorization? It, exactly. Uh, many people still think it's federal funding. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. But um, no, today it's, uh, there is an Oregon state statute that authorizes um, local jurisdictions, including cities, to identify, again, these blighted areas um, that, uh, per the statute, are harmful to the health welfare and safety of the citizens and um, do this sort of emergency financing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so in Portland obviously we're operating under an Oregon law. Do other states have these same kind of laws that allow the formation of urban renewal districts? They do. There's, um, it's interesting, there's I think bec probably because of the the economic times that we live in, um, states I, and, and I don't know how many states have them, whether they all have them, but there is a bit of a trend away from it. California recently ended urban renewal because it was just such a drain on um, schools and other services. Okay, all right, good. And, and so explain this process. What, why is it a drain on these other, other districts and services? Well, as I said, there's, um, you know, we, when we pay our property taxes, that property tax dollar is divided into a number of pieces of the pie. Um, uh, about a third goes to city, into the city coffers, the city general fund, about a third goes into the county, and about a third goes into the schools. So um, when an urban renewal district is formed, and let's just take for an example the Portland State urban renewal area, the city has decided to they, they are going to spend $169 million in that district. So they, what they will do is borrow $169 million over the life of the district and then to repay that $169 million plus interest, they will um, take the property tax revenue that would normally flow to the general fund, to the schools and the county and use it to repay um, that debt. Oh, oh, okay, all right. So, so this is money. For instance, the school district is just not going to get, or the county is just not going to get it. Right. Okay. Or the general fund. So, mm -hmm. you know, streets, fire, police, you know, all all of those services um, have less money than okay. they normally would. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, you know, there's, it's not every dollar. It's um, when an urban renewal district is formed. The, um, the what they call it, there's the frozen base. So let's say uh, in the district there's a million dollars of assessed value today. 
which of course is very low, but a million dollars assessed mm -hmm. value. It's um, the property tax dollars on any increase in assessed value over the 30-year life of the district is what would be um, going to the uh, to the urban renewal district. Oh, okay, and so that increase is what goes to the district, and then they make that's what pays for the for the actually to repay the money that's used to pay, to uh, to uh, finance the the exactly. improvements. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So. Uh, the City Council, the Portland City Council, um, well, it's like, who, who in the uh, Portland City government then came up with this proposal for the Portland State Urban Renewal District? Well, th there is a Portland Development Commission, and, and that is their principal mission is um, developing, monitoring um, urban renewal districts. So there was a, a but this I think was a, a um, in large part driven by Mayor Adams. This was a, an area that um, he's very much interested in uh, developing. It was originally a much larger district. There was, I don't know if you saw the press coverage, it was called the Lobster District because it oh. was this very strangely shaped district that um, looked very much like a lobster. Oh. So that, that there was huge objections to that district because it was so large and it was so meandering and you know just uh, kind of uh, basically out of control. So that that was objected to by many many people and and entities. That was withdrawn. And what we're seeing with Portland State is is a smaller version of that. Okay. All right. And and this smaller version does it include only Portland State or are there other properties? Well, it's it again. It's a very. It's not you, typically you'll see an urban renewal district is um, kind of a rectangular, you know, mm -hmm. co cohesive neighborhood. What we're seeing lately, what the Portland City Council has done is um, sort of draw some strange boundaries partly to pick up the area that they want to really invest money in, and it seems that they're also trying to pick up areas so that they can um, finance the repayment of the debt. So this one extends from Portland State up to Lincoln High School. Okay, okay, and was, those areas are close, but they're mm. not contiguous. They're not, they're, they're, they are, you know, ultimately very tangentially contiguous. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. uh-huh, right, so, okay. Yeah. Okay, and why would they include Port why, why would they include Lincoln High School? Well, you know, when the um, the city and the county, uh, I mean, sorry, the county and the schools are obviously the most effective taxing jurisdictions because they um, lose all these tax revenues. So when an urban renewal district is proposed, the schools and the county um, they don't have any right to say no to the to the district. But there obviously is some um, negotiating going on about whether uh, or what monies they might be um, given in the course of the district. Oh, uh -huh. So th I think clearly the the, the ten million dollar piece um, that Portland uh, that the Portland Public Schools will be given is part of that negotiation as well as the 19 million that's oh, okay. going to the county for a so new county building. So it kind of sweetens building. the pot for the support of the school district yeah, so makes, they might support this. Yeah, exactly. Whereas otherwise they exactly. would probably be in opposition. Exactly. I see, okay, okay, all right. And there was a how, affordable housing component to this district also? Right, now the city has a policy now that um, in any urban renewal district that 30% of the monies must be spent on affordable housing. Oh, okay. All right. And define affordable housing for us. Well, it's um, in terms of uh, it's really the zero to sixty percent for uh, of median family income housing for uh, people who earn zero to sixty cent uh -huh. percent median family income for rental housing and zero to one hundred percent for um, ownership housing. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. And uh, so, what were what were some of the other concerns raised by the by the uh, League of Women Voters? Well, as a as an outset, we you know our the the starting point with any urban renewal district is to look to the to the state statute, which is to say, you know, no, the first and foremost uh, determination has to be made is that the area is blighted, and we don't think this district um, qualifies under the Oregon state statute as blighted. It's um, you know, it's a it's a lovely area. It's got the beautiful South Park blocks. It's got the mm -hmm. Portland State, um, you know, streetcar running through there. Uh, lots of construction going on. Um, 
you know, they're, they're just, it, it, in our view, does not meet the blight test in any respect. So that's, you know, that's the first issue. The second issue is the, uh, the state statute also states very clearly that every, the, they have to do a plan, and in that plan, the city has to identify in great detail the plans for the money and um, what, uh, what the other sources of funding will be, because typically urban renewal districts also bring in other kinds of funding. Um, this plan is the sketchiest plan that we have ever seen, and we've been looking at urban renewal now for over 15 years. There is absolutely no detail in the plan whatsoever. Um, it, it didn't get the usual public comment and scrutiny period, um, so we don't think it complies with Oregon law. Um, and then the, the projects that they have identified, in an, and the league completely appreciates the need to have a strong urban university, and we certainly support thoughtful public investment in um, those kinds of projects. What we're concerned about is that they are reaching out and grabbing these other monies from um, entities that, especially in these economic times, really can't afford to lose. So, um, so, and the projects that they have identified are not projects that cure any sort of blight, nor do they, um, because Portland State is not a tax-paying entity, they're not the kind of projects that will generate tax revenue uh -huh. for which to repay the debt down the road. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, the, the fact that Portland State isn't going to repay the debt, then who is going to repay the debt? Well, this is where they've drawn in kind of an interesting um, part of the district. And there's two sections that were, that one is part of the South Park Urban Renewal District right now. Which was the first urban renewal district in Portland. Well, was, yeah. And the other one is the South Auditorium District. So I think the South oh, Auditorium. Oh, I'm sorry. The South was Auditorium, Auditorium was right. the first one. Yes. So there's right. the. Um, right. So so the South Auditorium has been retired now, and so the promise of urban renewal. I'm sorry. Renewals retired means. Re ended. Ended. Okay. Which Portland doesn't wow. always do with their urban renewal. Just mm -hmm. they keep re-upping them, mm -hmm. but the, sort of the promise of urban renewal is schools, county, um, city. You will forego revenues for some period of time, but we're but at the end of the day, there will be such fabulous investment mm -hmm. that you will be repaid and then some from the you know the increase in property tax revenues sure. from uh -huh. from the new district. So what? For, so the South Auditorium District has ended and should now be fulfilling that promise. But what they're doing is they're drawing in. Um, a portion of that district back into this district, and, and the same with the park box. So, and that isn't even ended yet. So uh -huh. they're not even reaping the benefits of that urban renewal district. So they're drawing those back in, and it seems like with the clear purpose for doing that is to provide some revenue generating blocks to repay the debt that will be incurred uh -huh. over the 30 years. Uh -huh. Okay, all right, so we're kind of, Robbing Peter to pay Paul. Exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, I know that it's you, you know when you oppose something that doesn't necessarily give you a responsibility to suggest how they should be doing it. Mm -hmm. But do you have an idea, or do you have a recommendation of how the city should be financing these kinds of projects? Well, there's all you know. There's all kinds of different ways to finance. I think the city, with particularly with Portland State, is just. You know, there isn't a lot of money available these days, and urban renewal is one of the easiest ways for the city to do, um, to finance things. It's very under the radar, it's very invisible, it doesn't require any sort of vote by the public. Um, so it is, um, it is it's really easy money for the city to get projects done that they want. I think Mayor Adams expressed his frustration that there isn't state funding coming for Portland State. So he wants to make sure we have a strong urban university. So he is sort of justifying, you know, the end justifies the means. We don't agree. We don't think that uh, we, we like the concept of a strong university. We don't think it justifies taking money from schools and, and other uh, social services.
So what would we what would we do? Um, well, I think we've seen some progress over the time that we've been involved. There is um, there has been a little bit of a limitation on what the, the, the city can take. They can't take the school option levy money anymore, um, and the the affected districts also begin to share money earlier. If the district is successful, they will start sharing in those tax revenues down the road, but sooner than they would have. Uh -huh. Um, I think the other thing we'd like to see is there has never been any sort of exit analysis of any of these districts. When the, um, when the plan is done, there's a big analysis saying, you know, if we don't do urban renewal, you know, here's what, our, here's what the growth in that district would look like, you know, flat. Uh -huh. If we do do urban renewal, you know, the growth is going to look like this. But there's never any exit study or any... Um, audit, if mm -hmm. you will, about whether or not that growth would have occurred with or without urban renewal. Mm -hmm. So we really think, um, you know, the taxpayer, it's, it's, they need to justify these um, and make sure that they actually are achieving the ends and that they would have uh, achieved them and, and not have achieved them without urban oh, renewal. Okay, yeah. And maybe a good example, that's all, I mean, this is all very complex, but the River District, is an urban renewal district, the Pearl, which is really you know, the River District, is the Pearl District, and um, which is a very upscale which district, is a at, very upscale uh, right area now. And is it, it is it still an urban renewal district? It still district? is an urban renewal district, and mm -hmm. it's when it was uh, formed, the league opposed its uh, formation as well because even though it was an undeveloped area, it was the hottest real estate market in town. Mm -hmm. So things were taking off. Um, sure, go ahead and make some, if the city wants to dedicate its piece of the pie to that area to do some things, take down the Lovejoy ramp, whatever, you know, that's fine. That's a decision they can make as council. But to take this money from schools and county um, for an area that was, you know, to really developing on its own, it was in our view inappropriate. And then, um, over the course of time, it went from a $300 million assessed value to over a billion dollars in assessed value. Um, so, but then they re-upped the district and... So they extended the period. They extended period. the district uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they again had to make that finding that it was blighted. So just a couple of years ago, they made a determination that the Pearl District wow. was still blighted and um, you know has delayed the return of the the new tax revenues on a, over a billion dollars in new uh, um, new assessed value. Wow. So yeah. that's a, it's yeah. just a so just just for uh, <laughs> reference, the the mayor Adams very recently said that the city was going to contribute seven million dollars mm -hmm. to the Portland School District to, right. to help them over their budget crunch so that we're not laying off teachers mm -hmm. and increasing school sizes mm -hmm. or classroom sizes. So if the Pearl District was returning money to the school district as it should be uh, at this point, uh, the mayor wouldn't actually have to make that kind of well, they're allocation. Well, certainly, they're you know, certainly taking you know $7 million from the city's general fund, which would not normally go to schools because cities can't by law um, you know, pay for schools. You know, the way the school funding works is property tax, the, that piece of the pie that goes into, um, that's to go to schools goes to the state and then is redistributed out on a per capita basis. And I think that's one of the things that's been really frustrating to the league is every time an urban renewal district is formed and we raise the concern that, you know, what an impact this has on schools. Annually, right now, statewide, urban renewal has, um, take $70 million a year out of the state school fund. And that's before, wow. that's even before the Portland State urban renewal area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, $70 million out of the state school fund annually, that's a lot of money. That's a that's lot so, of teachers, you know, so, yeah. sort of maybe, you know, people say, well, it's a, not a, it's a small percentage of the total budget, but it's those last dollars that really count mm -hmm. in terms of funding teachers and other critical services. So, um, so I think the, you know, and, the, and I, was, I started to say was that the, the, the attitude has always been, oh, well, the state will make up the difference from its general fund dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, there are no 
other dollars these days to backfill. So it is really, truly a loss to the school district. I think the attitude in Portland is, well, you know, we send a lot of money to the state, we don't get it all back, so if we can grab a piece of it here and there, you know, good for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you, do you, because we've got the November elections coming up for city officials mm -hmm. uh, and statewide officials, mm -hmm. do you think that this might become uh, an issue in the, in the mayor's race or in the city council races? Well, I think it is. You know, there has been some discussion among among uh, the mayoral candidates about urban renewal. It's been interesting on this particular district because typically, you know, the vote is taken. It, these districts always pass because there there isn't any, um, um, you know, uh, all the powers that be, of course, want these districts to be in place, and the school and the counties have no power. But and usually that's it, it's done, we move on. But this time it's been different. I mean, programs like yours, I mean, p the press is still, um, you know, is, is still focusing on this because I think they're beginning to see that the use of urban renewal by the Portland City Council is a bit novel, mm -hmm. it's a bit overreaching, and, um, and something needs to be done. I, you know, Clackamas County recently, in, in its last election, um, the voters decided that from now on they will be the ones who decide whether or not there will be an urban renewal district. So I think, you know, as I said in my testimony, is like the natives are getting a little restless. You know, mm -hmm. people are starting to appreciate that this is a, a, a really huge economic hit, and um, and people are starting to take a look. So I do hope it is an issue in the election. Uh, yeah, it certainly sounds. Bad. I, I, and I I kind of wonder how we motivate uh, people to realize the effects that these districts have had right. on, our, on our lives. Right, and that's what I think is fantastic about programs like this, because I don't think people really realize um, it, is, it is fairly invisible, it's very complicated. I think there is this idea still some, you know, many sophisticated people still think it's federal dollars, you mm -hmm. know, free money from the feds, uh -huh. and people don't realize it is robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, it is taking, you know, and I think in the case of Portland State, it's sort of ironic, you know, we're taking money from schools around the state of Oregon whose students will be going to Portland State, mm -hmm. um, but we're taking money out of the school coffers in order to, to build buildings at Portland State. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. And, and you've given, uh, you know, several examples uh, that indicate that these are not blighted areas. And certainly mm -hmm. Portland State is not blighted, mm -hmm. as you've noticed. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of new construction going on there. Uh, has a really incredible infrastructure now, uh, and I'm sure that there are many projects that could be done. Mm -hmm. um, but do we want to rob our schools? Right. Do we want to rob from from uh, the general general funds for social services in order to fund those kind of projects? Right. And that's kind of the question. Right. Right. And it kind of reminds me also, uh, a couple of years ago there was a big. Uh, to do about business energy tax credits mm -hmm. that were being used mm -hmm. um, for uh, funding uh, wind farm constructions in eastern Oregon mm -hmm. and the fact that th those programs were taking funds out of the general revenue for the state uh, and giving them, passing them a around for this construction uh, and uh, it was hard to see why we would do that when we're in such dire need of funds ourselves. Right, right. right. Well, I think, you know, unfortunately the statute, I think the way the blight test is written, I mean, it's clearly intended to be for areas that are really struggling or really um, just, as they say, need emergency funds. Um, the way the statute is written, there is a kind of a, a list of things. So what the city does that are indicia of blight, so what the city does is says, for instance, in Portland State, says that the roads are not up to par. Well, that's one of the things on the list. Well, you know, that may be the case, but in fact, no monies are dedicated under the urban renewal plan for mm -hmm. roads mm -hmm. to be improved in the district. So, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, if the politicians were honest, they would say, you know, this isn't really, you know, this isn't blighted, this isn't a, a true urban renewal. Um, uh, area or project, but this is the only money that we can get our hands on yes. to do the projects they mm -hmm. want. And we don't criticize the projects, although in this case I think you'd have to say is are these projects, you know, they don't seem very important 
compared to the services that will be cut as mm -hmm. a result. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, we're not criticizing the project. We're just saying this is not the way to fund them. Right, okay, right. And is there an effort to, no, at, at this point, has the city council already approved this? It is approved. It is approved. And is there uh, any, any, in that approval, w did they ask for additional detailed plans? Well, no. I mean, that's the kind so of the shocking really thing. Start, There's no. kind of a okay. list of well, we, we, the funds may be used for this, or it may be used for that. It may be, you know, talking about a business school, you know. Um, some green energy things, some you know, they but there there's no specificity at all. Mm -hmm. It is it is rather it's a blank shocking. Check. It's, it's a blank check, and what they don't include is they don't have the specifics on how the what they call the 30 percent set aside for affordable housing. There's no detail in the plan, so that's one thing we'd like to see is when those plans get developed that they be incorporated into the plan so that they're legally binding. Mm -hmm. Because right now it's just a policy that the city follows but there isn't anything binding in the plan regarding affordable housing. Okay, all right, well very good. Thank yeah. you very much for being our guest thank today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have been talking with Shelley uh, Lawrenson, who is a member of the Action Committee of the League of Women Voters here in Portland, and we've been talking about the Portland State Urban Renewal District. Uh, I, I don't, uh, so a additional um, actions that people might take here in Portland would be to question candidates running for public office as to the as to the suitability of this kind of funding mechanism, uh, both for Portland State uh, District and for future districts, because they seem to always be working on more of these districts, or uh, as Shelley has said, re-upping them and extending the the life of them. So uh, that concludes our program for today. Uh, the the uh, mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to uh, end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more at our national website, www.thealliancefordemocracy.org, or our Portland website, www.afd-pdx.org. Uh, if you uh, would like to watch this episode again or missed a, a previous episode, you can do so now. Uh, Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe to the series. I want to thank our crew today, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Beth Kerwin, and Janet Morris. Without them, we wouldn't be on the air. And of course, we want to extend a thank you for our audience for watching. And we hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.